Not all SSRIs are the same. If you've ever wondered why one SSRI works better for you or why another causes side effects, you're not alone. Today, we'll break down how these antidepressants differ, not just in their serotonin effects, but also in their receptor actions, metabolism, and side effect profiles. Stay with me because by the end of the video, you'll know how to choose the right SSRI for different clinical presentations. This video, however, is not meant to be construed as medical advice. Each choice of an antidepressant is an individualized decision. So always discuss this with your medical professional. Welcome to Psychiatry Simplified. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist. This is the channel where we cover all things psychiatry, neuroscience, and mental health related. So if that's your thing, don't forget to hit the subscribe button to stay in touch with all our future releases. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, are amongst the most prescribed antidepressants, but sometimes they may be seen as interchangeable. That's not entirely accurate. The key mechanism of an SSRI, and I've covered this in the psychopharmacology of SSRIs here, what they do is they inhibit the serotonin transporter, CERT, which increases the levels of serotonin in the synaptic cleft. And this results in a number of receptor interactions. Now, depending on the half-lives, the effects on the neurotransmitter systems, there are varied responses. This means that selecting an SSRI is more than just choosing one at random. It's about thinking of the patient characteristics, the illness characteristics, and then the pharmacological characteristics, and then matching pharmacology to patient-specific needs. This is the essence of psychopharmacology. For clinicians to learn psychopharmacology effectively, on the academy, we have a seven and a half hour psychopharmacology masterclass combined with interactive courses on antidepressants, mood stabilizers, antipsychotic medications, advanced psychopharmacology of ADHD, etc. Because what we know as part of optimum education and to make a difference for patients, we've got to start off from the symptom expression connected to phenomenology, which then links to neurobiology and from the neurobiology arises the psychopharmacological principles and then the choice of the medication. So firstly, what is the role of serotonin? Serotonin 5-HD is a key neurotransmitter involved in mood, cognition, sleep, and appetite regulation. There are, of course, other functions as well. For example, serotonin is also found in platelets. In the central nervous system, serotonin modulates synaptic plasticity, learning, and stimulus reward contingencies. It plays an important role in how we respond to rewards and also aversion. It also modulates impulsivity and aggression. There are 14 serotonin receptor subtypes, but today we'll focus on the most relevant ones for SSRIs. So to illustrate these differences, let's look at six SSRIs and their unique characteristics. So the ones we cover are citalopram and escitalopram, fluoxetine, sertraline, fluvoxamine, paroxetine, and velazodone. Not a typical SSRI, but does have an SSRI action combined with other properties. So let's start off with citalopram and escitalopram. Escitalopram is the S enantiomer, a purified enantiomer of citalopram. Citalopram contains both R and S enantiomers. The R enantiomer has mild antihistamine properties, while the S enantiomer is responsible for the serotonin reuptake inhibition. A key aspect to take into account with these two is the QTC prolongation risk, which is dose dependent. This requires ECG monitoring, particularly if doses are above 40 milligrams for citalopram and above 20 milligrams for escitalopram. I've covered QTC prolongation in this video on this channel here. Now, when it comes to metabolism, i.e. pharmacokinetics, neither of them is a strong CYP inhibitor. And this is helpful because this prevents the interaction with other medications, particularly in, say, elderly patients where there are multiple other medications that might be prescribed for comorbidities. It's also helpful in generalized anxiety disorder and those who need fewer drug interactions. If you had to choose between these two, escitalopram would be the go-to because the postulated better tolerability and the lower QTC risk compared to citalopram in terms of the millisecond prolongation. Next, let's look at fluoxetine. 
This is known as the activating SSRI. Why? Because its unique 5-HT2C antagonism gives it some interesting properties. 5-HT2C antagonism increases prefrontal dopamine and therefore potential promotivation effects are present. Now, interestingly, in agomelatine, which is an antidepressant, it's not an SSRI, and I've covered it in the video here, agomelatine is an M1, M2 agonist and a 5-HT2C antagonist. And the combination of these effects increases frontal, dopamine, and noradrenaline, and therefore is a very useful agent in addressing anhedonia, amotivation, and also reversing the emotional blunting that can occur with SSRIs. Fluoxetine has a long half-life. Its active metabolite, norfluoxetine, has a half-life of 7 to 14 days. This becomes important because the advantage is fewer withdrawal issues because of the long half-life and an inbuilt tapering as a result after stopping it, but there's a slower washout. So if one was to bring in another serotonergic agent, one would need to be mindful of this interaction that can increase the risk of serotonergic potentiation, i.e. serotonin syndrome. So therefore, one should always consider the half-life when switching from fluoxetine to another agent that potentiates serotonin. How do we think of this? we multiply the half-life by five. So even at the lower end, norfluoxetine being seven days half-life, you multiply that by five. So approximately 95% of the medication is washed out at seven into five, 35 days. So we've got to be mindful for up to 35 days, there is a reasonable exposure of fluoxetine there. Next, fluoxetine also has CYP2D6 and CYP3A4 inhibition. Now this can interact with certain medications. For example, increased levels of risperidone, benzodiazepines, which are metabolized by CYP3A4, such as diazepam. So therefore, fluoxetine may be best suited for patients with comorbid apathy, low energy, or those who struggle with adherence in a way, because sometimes for some individuals, we find that they might experience withdrawal symptoms before the 24 hours, before taking the medication. So fluoxetine's long half-life makes it ideal for such patients. But its activating effect can sometimes be problematic in patients that are wanting to treat anxiety. Third, sertraline. Sertraline can be considered as the dopaminergic SSRI. Now fluoxetine promotes dopamine in the prefrontal cortex through 5-HT2C antagonism. Sertraline affects dopamine transporter. So what it does is it inhibits dopamine transporter and thereby increases dopamine levels in the synaptic cleft. And this can improve dopamine transmission, can improve motivation, energy, and concentration. Sertraline also has effects on the sigma-1 receptor. This is postulated to have immunomodulatory properties, anxiolytic, and mild antipsychotic properties as well. Now, sertraline pharmacokinetically has CYP2D6 inhibition. Now this can increase levels of tricyclic antidepressants and risperidone. Again, best suited for patients that require dopaminergic potentiation such as low motivation, fatigue, cognitive fog. Now, although I've mentioned fluoxetine and sertraline as agents that have this dopaminergic potentiation, what happens with SSRIs is with higher doses, the serotonergic activity in the amygdala, the amygdala dampening, if you want to think about it that way, the amygdala activation that is reduced can result in emotional blunting, contribute to sexual dysfunction. So therefore, these dopaminergic potentiation properties may be overshadowed by the amygdala dampening. Why? Because amygdalas associated with arousal forms a crucial component of the mesolimbic pathway, which also mediates pleasure and sexual function. So therefore, it ends up being a balance. If the dose goes too high, the emotional blunting overshadows any of these other benefits. This is a key nuance to take into account with SSRIs. Fourth, we have fluvoxamine, the sigma-1 modulator. Flu fluvoxamine sigma-1 receptor binding gives it the anti-anxiety properties. I mentioned mild antipsychotic benefits, but what was really interesting is fluvoxamine showed benefits in COVID-19 infection. It was postulated that the sigma-1 receptor binding is immunomodulatory and thereby reduced 
the effects of COVID-19, particularly with regards to mortality. Now, fluvoxamine is a very interesting agent when it comes to pharmacokinetics because it has strong CYP1A2, CYP2C19, and CYP3A4 inhibition. Now, clozapine is metabolized by CYP1A2, so it can significantly increase levels of clozapine. Now, this is sometimes used for therapeutic benefit, the synergy by combining clozapine and fluvoxamine. And what happens there is it increases the levels of clozapine. Essentially what it does is it changes the clozapine nor clozapine ratio and thereby can reduce certain side effects, for example, hypersalivation. And this is used in clinical practice. However, one needs to be very cautious as of course, higher levels of clozapine come with its own side effects. On the other hand, it can also increase levels of olanzapine, and benzodiazepines. It's best suited for patients with OCD. Fluvoxamine seems to have this benefit for patients with OCD and comorbid anxiety disorders. Fluvoxamine, interestingly, due to its 5-HD1A partial agonist activity at doses of 100 or below, is also beneficial in treating SSRI-induced sexual dysfunction. So the clinical takeaway is that this is quite a unique agent, but its pharmacokinetic interactions is something to be very, very careful about. Next, number five, paroxetine. This is the sedating SSRI with a high withdrawal risk. And why does that happen? Paroxetine, in addition to the SSRI properties, has strong anticholinergic properties, making it quite distinct from the other SSRIs. Now, this muscarinic receptor antagonism provides more calming and sedating effects than other SSRIs, which is postulated to be beneficial in PTSD. But due to the same effect, when paroxetine stopped, we not only get a serotonergic rebound, we also get a cholinergic rebound. And this makes the withdrawal really, really problematic. You can view the video that I've done in detail on SSRI withdrawal because SSRI withdrawal, it has a multifactorial etiology. And for those experiencing prolonged withdrawal, it's worth watching this video. Peroxidine also has CYP2D6 inhibition and therefore can impact on tricyclic metabolism, increasing levels and other agents as well. It's best suited for patients with severe anxiety or panic disorder comorbid who need a sedating effect. And number six, velazodone. It's the SSRI plus 5-HD1A agonist activity. So in a way, it's an SSRI and because of its 5-HD1A partial agonist activity, it makes it functionally unique. I mentioned that fluvoxamine also tends to have this, but this has a prominent 5-HD1A partial agonist activity, which contributes to faster onset of action. Now, interestingly, the same 5-HD1A effect is also used in vortioxetine. Vortioxetine also has CERT blockade, so it has SSRI-like properties, but not as prominent as SSRIs along with multimodal effects on other serotonergic receptors. To learn about vortioxetine, you can listen to this video here. Now, velocidone pharmacokinetically is highly protein bound. And when that happens, it can displace warfarin or other protein bound drugs. So who's it best suited for? It's suitable for patients with major depressive disorder who need faster symptom relief. So the takeaway would be that it may work faster than traditional SSRIs due to its dual mechanism, but requires CYP3A4 metabolism monitoring. So before we end the video, I've taken you through sort of a simplified version of the differences between SSRIs. But when we think about SSRIs, what we've got to recognize is that there is a dose response relationship. SSRIs are very, very effective pharmacological agents to reduce the arousal response, to reduce anxiety, and hence are evidence-based in the treatment of anxiety. However, when we think about SSRIs for depression, and when we think about depression within the context of the ACE model, activity, cognition, and emotion, which is the reward dimensions, you see the activity and the cognitive dimensions depend on dopaminergic nor adrenergic potentiation because they involve the frontostriatal circuits. Serotonergic agents, because they're monoaminergic predominantly, they don't address the frontostriatal circuits as effectively. And we see this in melancholic depression. For clinicians, you can explore all of this on the melancholic and psychotic depression course on the academy, because this nuance becomes so, so important. Neurobiological evidence tells us that SSRIs do not address the executive control network, default mode network, connectivity because executive control network 
requires dopaminergic, noradrenergic, glutamatergic potentiation. SSRIs do not adequately provide that. And hence why we require broader spectrum antidepressants, neuromodulation to address this effectively. So coming back to SSRIs, what we can see is that not all SSRIs are the same. Choosing the right one depends on the patient's symptoms, drug interactions, and tolerability. So let's summarize the key differences. Citalopram, escitalopram, best tolerated, but QTC caution. Fluoxetine, the activating SSRI, long half-life, lowest risk of withdrawal. Sertraline, dopaminergic, good for fatigue, but comes with a dose response relationship. Fluvoxamine, sigma one binding in addition, good for OCD. Paroxetine, additional anticholinergic effects, sedating, helpful to reduce anxiety in panic disorder, PTSD, but high withdrawal risk. Velazodone, partial 5-HD1A agonist activity, faster action. So I hope that you found this video helpful. If you did, hit the like button and subscribe to our future releases. I look forward to seeing you in another video soon. Until then, stay curious. Bye-bye.